I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. This episode I'm interviewing horticultural journalist Matthew Appleby. Matthew writes for gardening magazines, national newspapers and the trade publication Horticulture Week and is currently the Garden Media Guild Journalist of the Year. This is the last of the vegan gardening series here on the podcast and I can't think of a better way to cap it off. Matthew is championing the vegan gardening movement as a natural progression of the whole green agenda. Vegan gardening dovetails so well with many of the concerns that are top of the agenda for many of us. Wildlife awareness, organic growing, a healthy diet, a healthy lifestyle. He touches on some things that many of us do without thinking, such as using manure on our gardens and why this doesn't work for him. And it's great because he flags up things in a really non-judgy way. The idea of vegan gardening isn't meant to make us feel uncomfortable. It's more about examining what we use and what we buy for our gardens so that we can make informed judgments because after all, to quote the old cliche, knowledge is power. Matthew's written a book called The Super Organic Gardener, which is due out on the 31st of January, and it offers loads of practical advice about growing plants if you're thinking of making the move towards organic gardening and away from using animal products. So I thoroughly recommend picking up a copy on Thursday. And make sure to stay tuned beyond the interview as I'll be announcing how you can win a copy of the book. I started out by asking Matthew to explain what his particular brand of gardening entails. I see it as being like organic gardening but going a step further because organic gardening isn't necessarily stock-free, meat-free, animal product-free gardening. You see it as the sort of cleanest form of gardening, but in fact, you can go a step further. And, you know, it's like how people used to see vegetarianism as, you know, the best way of eating. But obviously now veganism has become a lot more mainstream. And I mean, it's an obvious next step. And to me, this is an obvious next step if you're an organic gardener or if you really care about what you're growing and what you're eating. And can you do vegan gardening without being organic? Do the two have to go hand in hand? Well, that's a really good question. I've never really thought about that. I suppose you can, yeah. I mean, it's a bit like you could use peat, couldn't you? You know, yeah. if you're a vegan gardener, mm. but you probably wouldn't because you wouldn't see it as environmentally sound. So it's a kind of holistic thing, isn't it? A, a whole green ethos where just artificial fertilizing chemicals just don't fit into the way you think about the world. So I can't really see any vegan gardener who wouldn't be an organic gardener because you just view the world as a green place where you want to be green. Yeah, I think you can be, but you wouldn't be. I mean, it's, it's kind of the same way that vegans, I don't know, can they still eat Oreos? You used to be able to eat Oreos if mm. you were a vegan because they've got so many artificial ingredients in, they don't actually have any milk in them. But you yeah. probably wouldn't eat them because they're just junk. Yes, true. Yeah, having said that, I have been known to have a few. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think for me, it was a labelling issue because I think veganic gardening assumes that you're organic but you don't necessarily yeah. have to be saying that you're yeah. a vegan gardener could just mean that you're a vegan who gardens so for me vegan gardening is the best term i suppose that i can think of to, to label the movement i'm with you there and, and there is a bit about this labeling which i think is important because when i spoke at veg fest in october it was the permaculture section and i don't think the general population understands what permaculture is and i want this to be a popular movement you know i want it to affect more people than people who already know about it so i think we need to get a term which is vegan gardening mm. not organic not permaculture not stock free not super organic which is what the publishers decided to use for my book but vegan because it's just much more simple mm. Yeah, I agree. I do think it's it's it does what it says on the tin. So why is that style of gardening important to you and why is it important to the wider environment? To say, you know, if you care about what you eat, you need to care about how you grow it. And um, now we've got, you know, a minimum of 600,000 vegans, but maybe 3 million or somewhere in between in the UK. So the only way to tell the true provenance is to grow it your own, really. I mean, that's the perfect way of, of doing this. I mean, look at foot of mouth that's come up in Scotland recently. It shows that the food standards in Britain aren't good. You get told they are, but they're not. Mm -hmm. So it is important to garden as purely as possible if you want to actually grow something which, you know, is going to be as good for you as possible. Yeah. And for the wider environment too, because you can do your bit and you can feel better about yourself. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is veganism, do you think, 
it is gaining a lot of traction at the moment. Is it perhaps a backlash to all the problems that we've had relating to food over the past few years? I would say so. And, I, and I've, I've been talking a bit about how you, it's, it's a time of flux as well. It's a time of division and it's a time of debate to do with Brexit, to do with Trump. You know, if you're looking at these big wider issues and obviously to do with online. So people have views and people's views are quite polarized at the moment. So people are taking stances and that means they're getting more extreme. And the way I've been looking at it, 30 years ago, we had... <laughs> Smiths and meat is murder, but we also had the Animal Liberation Front and we had Hunt Saboteurin. Mm. These things maybe work in kind of generational cycles slightly, you know, because 30 years before that, you maybe you had uh, a lot of radicalism or at the late 60s and hippies and a lot of vegetarianism then. And then before that, in the late 40s, you had the vegan society formed and you had a lot of political extremism there post war when people were finding a position in a kind of new free world Hmm. maybe i'm going too far there well no it's definitely interesting i had not thought about that at all so a lot of people are getting very interested in vegan eating but i think for some people it's not necessarily something that they would translate through into gardening because even as a gardener and as a vegan i hadn't really put the two and two together until i went to see you at the vegan garden festival what are a lot of people using do you think unwittingly i mean i was vegetarian before i was vegan as well but i would put blood fish and bone on a garden do you think there are a lot of products that people are using unwittingly that come from animal sources well i mean animal meals is a big one you know it's just a norm isn't it like Mm. people put horse manure on on a plot and you wouldn't think otherwise and, you know, I think this is just trying to make people think about it. When I first started writing about it, the only real information I could find was stuff which was going out to people who already knew about it, like a very small circle, vegan organic network type people. The only book I could find on Amazon was from 1986, Veganic Gardening, you know, 30 years ago. I mean, there are books around it, which I've found since, but they're basically preaching to a the converted into some way so now it's become a much much bigger issue and it, has, and it is doing week by week as we go along i want people to realize that maybe they're not gardening as good as what they could be but it, i mean it's not just the products you add in on like the animal manures the blood fish and bone fertilizers because these products aren't labeled food products are labeled so you can check the label but gardening products aren't labeled so you don't actually know what's in them you don't know what's in peat you don't know what's in the fertilizers the, and there will be products in the future which I think will be labelled, or they'll certainly be labelled as a vegan symbol. But I'd also add stuff like wild bird care products that people are buying. And, you know, I'm sort of questioning whether you should feed birds in gardens, because I don't think that's what wildlife gardening should be about. You know, I don't think trying to attract animals to your garden and treat them like pets or treat your garden like a zoo is wildlife gardening. But mm. like a lot of wildlife gardeners would say that. Yeah, I read that in your book. I was interested. I mean, I do feed my birds. But as you say, anything like the fat balls and the suet balls, all of that are presumably byproducts from the meat and dairy industries. And so all the time I'm buying those products, I'm kind of, in a way, roundabout way, supporting those industries. So it's a really interesting question. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be too sort of preachy about it. You know, it's obviously not the worst thing in the world to do to feed the birds in the garden, but you might be feeding them suet, as you say. But it's, it's a broader thing about, you know, should we have pets? Should we treat our wild animals as something we can sort of use for our entertainment? Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. It's just good to think about these things because a lot of things you just do automatically. So it doesn't hurt, I don't think, to actually stop and think a little bit about the ramifications of, you know, even if you're not saying to people, oh, you can't feed your wild birds. But it is interesting and it's, it's, it's a very good point and it is something that we do need to think about. But I think what surprises a lot of people, and again, for me, I just thought, why can't I put manure in my garden? You know, what is wrong with it? it from your point of view, why shouldn't vegan garden? use manure you, you know you make a good point about you know what's wrong with using manure from your local horse sanctuary where these animals you know aren't farmed animals you know they're rescued animals i guess there's, there's health reasons around not using manures you know they've got zoonoses such as e coli listeria salmonella we've seen loads and loads of health problems emerging from them the other thing about horse manures is they've got um 
pesticides in them because the, the grass they're eating is full of pesticides. So you're sticking on your plants, might well kill your plants. You know, there's been studies done around that in recent years. You know, we've seen foot and mouth, we've seen mad cow disease coming from the animal farming industry. We've seen horse meat scandals. You know, the animal industry can't be trusted regarding your health. Mm. Obviously, vegans don't want to support animal farming. So if you're using the byproducts, you know, you could say it's a similar same as using leather, you know, if you're using the manures. Well, I have been asked by this. I got asked by this by someone, a BBC researcher on Radio 4 who said that they're going to shit anyway. But it's like, <laughs> that's not the point. <laughs> it's not the point. No, it's not. No, it isn't really when you think about it. <laughs> I think that's important for, you know, some people, particularly uh, there was a Daily Mail article out this morning, which I just mentioned to you, but that was saying, you know, oh, well, how ridiculous that you can't use manure. But even if you said you sourced it from somewhere like a rescue sanctuary, even then there are implications beyond just the animal welfare. It's also the kind of human welfare. I do know somebody who got very ill from manure. So, you know, there are other implications, which, again, are important to think about. I dug around and did a bit of research into that and found some scientific papers. And when I wrote a piece for Gardener's World in October, I included that. And they wanted more references. They wanted more proof. But, you know, I think having some scientific papers saying that these bacteria can remain for three months within the manures and they can give you very bad health problems is an issue. Obviously, people have been using them all, for all time. Mm. So, you know, it suits a lot of farming, but it, it certainly is the first thing to get rid of if you're going to be a vegan gardener. I think what you said when I heard you speak about your book was it was really important what you said. It's not about what you can't use. It's about what you can use. And I think that's probably the key to it. Well, I just crossed my mind then when I was saying this is the first thing that you can you cut out. It's not necessarily the first thing you cut out. It's the first thing you replace. Mm. It's about the replacement, not about what not you what you're not using. And another problem, well, uh, an issue that has been mentioned in response to the growing interest in vegan eating is that a lot of the products that vegans eat will actually contribute to the destruction of soils. And you mentioned in your book that. On your personal plot, you use the no-dig technique of gardening. So why is that central to how you garden? Well, you can leave the soil fauna to draw the nutrients down into the soil naturally and you retain the natural soil structure. You avoid panning, which is creating a halve, barriers so the water can't get in. You avoid erosion, you avoid nutrient loss. You also avoid weed spread by not digging the soil. The, the secret, well, it's not even a secret, you just use a hoe, you hoe the weeds mm. and you grow cover crops and you don't leave much soil which isn't covered. But digging, I used to love digging because it's great exercise, but you just don't need to do it for mm. a start. And it's actually a bad thing to do. I just talked about that Gardener's World piece, like Charles Dowden wrote a piece answering my thing about vegan gardening and basically agreed with everything I said, apart from he said he didn't like the label. Obviously, Charles Dowding is Mr. No Dig Gardener and um, No Dig Dig Gardening is absolutely taking off. You know, people are increasingly realizing that that's the way to do things. At the Horse Loke event, the uh, vegan garden event, someone did ask, um, are you allowed to dig up potatoes? And um, <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> you are, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, talking, yeah, digging is one of those things, the satisfaction of digging over a plot and then reflecting back on it is going to be yeah. really hard to kind of get get some people out of doing that. But long term, it won't do any good. No, exactly. And that is, again, that's another thing. It's just considering sort of your, the implications of what you're doing. But one of the major problems that us gardeners who have always done things traditionally are going to find is that we are inundated initially maybe with pests you know and everyone's going to say slugs 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 you know that there's such a big problem what do you do can you give me just a, a few examples of the ways that you deal with pests in your garden yeah well, i just pick them off slugs and snails you just go out early in the morning or late at night and pick them off you use green manures they've got something else to eat you use wild patches for predators you use sacrificial plants but the bottom line is if it costs an animal's life to grow it then just don't grow it Mm. You know, it's not like you're trying to be self-sufficient. I've written a lot about allotments over the years and uh, whether you can be self-sufficient by growing enough food on your plot and how big your plot needs to be to be self-sufficient. But at the end of the day, you know, you're going to go to the supermarket and buy a load of potatoes and carrots 50p. So if you have to kill a load of slugs to create 50p's worth of potatoes and carrots, just don't do it. Yeah, that actually is an, is another question I was going to ask. Is there anything that you don't grow because it's just too difficult? 
there's lots of things I don't grow because I'm not very good at growing them. <laughs> like <laughs> carrots, I'm really bad at growing, and they always come out rubbish. And I do try most things. You know, luckily as a horticultural journalist, I get sent a lot of seeds and stuff to to grow. So, I, you know, I grow about thirty different things a year. And, you know, I try stuff out. I mean, I was just looking at some of the winter brassicas I put in yesterday when I was down in the allotment, and they've all got eaten to bits. So I've yet to work out how to sort them out. I mean, I need to net them better. Mm. But, you know, there are ways, like non-kind of killing ways, which basically are mostly a kind of nets to stop things getting eaten. Barriers really is kind of barriers, the, yeah. the main thing. That's, yeah, the, one, that's the one, yeah. 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 I mean, in the book, I kind of give quite a lot of background information about that. When I've been doing talks, I haven't really been doing that blow by blow. This is how you grow a carrot or whatever. Mm. You know, I have heard people do do talks like that. So I'll, I'll leave them to do that. And I want to talk about broader issues and, and tell jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's brilliant. There's got to be place for both because some people do need step by step instructions because a lot of books assume that that's already a given that people have that knowledge and and actually it's not so I think maybe I'll do some how-to videos with <laughs> picking picking slugs off of things yeah. I mean that stuff's all in a the book there are the step-by-step -step how to grow it what nutrition values it's got all the sort of dry stuff which might ne not necessarily present well in a speech yeah yeah that's true that and that is actually a really very good point which is I did notice the nutrition information in your book and also I noticed that you did say that organic vegetables are higher in nutrients and I did see somebody who's very well known in the world of horticulture um, refuting this on Twitter recently so who's right? I'm getting information from Soil Association, the Vegan Organic Network, Garden Organic. There's a Newcastle University study in 2014, which said there's higher nutritional values. I mean, I've, I'm not a scientist. I don't know. I just got, kind of go with it. I mean, I, I kind of think if people are saying they're armed, then they're just, you know, it's not the reason they probably are. But, you know, I'd, I'd listen to them if they say they're armed, but I, I, don't, I don't believe them at the moment. And for the nutrient figures I use in the book, there's government figures which tell you what nutrients they are. So I, I'm saying, you know, vegans need to grow they don't need to, but it's better if they grow stuff with more protein, more iron or whatever, because they're not getting that from meat and fish, eggs, whatever. So certain crops have got a lot of protein, certain crops have got a lot of iron, and certain crops have got a lot of other types of minerals, and it, it basically lists them, and hopefully it'll give you a hit list of what's going to be most effective. The other question I think that's more of a practical consideration as well is trying to find, as you say, these replacement products. I know you do list some in your book and you go through the kind of pros and cons, but what are just some composts that gardeners can use that are vegan? Because I know that's going to be a big problem for people. First off, fibre is amolan gold, carbon gold, Melcourt do one. What I found interesting in this is, you know, I go to these veg fests and they've got loads and loads of vegan foods, you know, packet vegan foods like chocolate, whatever, loads of vegan food. But vegan garden products, even if they are vegan, haven't got the label on. So I was talking to someone who does rock dust, and I said, is it vegan? And they said, well, it probably is. And I said, well, why don't you just put it on? And they said, we'll lose sales. You know, it'll polarize it. And I said, no, it won't. It'll gain sales probably because, like, you know, people will buy it anyway, mm. and then vegans will buy it as well. But they haven't reached that level in gardening yet because they don't know what it is. I want them to know what it is. And I think with veganism, it reached a critical mass when loads and loads of vegan products come out. And you're reading the papers all the time now. Tesco has got 500 increase in vegan frozen food sales, et cetera, et cetera. You've all seen the stories. When gardening realizes that there is a such a thing as vegan gardening and they bring out vegan garden products or just stick a badge on it, stick a sticker on it, then that's when it's reached a critical mask and our work is done. Yeah, I agree. Again, that's opening up the minefield of fertilizers. I mean, what can people use to fertilize their plants? This is probably the most important thing. You know, I, I use comfrey in a bucket, like comfrey tea. And um, I use rock dust, as I just mentioned. Seaweed is really, really big. And I think there's loads of, loads of seaweed products coming out at the moment. Mm -hmm. There's biochar, obviously homemade compost. And the other thing is ash. Strictly speaking, in green terms, you shouldn't have fires. But, you know, there is stuff which won't compost. And also, I was thinking about what you were saying about, you know, there isn't the knowledge at the moment to label the products. And that, I think, is going to translate through into actually nurseries growing vegan plants or plants that have been grown according to vegan organic principles. 
Are there any nurseries doing that at the moment? There's hardly any. I rang up all the nurseries on the RHS organic nursery list. There was about 12, you know. Mm. I mean, one really good one is Pointsfield Herbs in the far north of Scotland and Ross and Cromarty, Mm -hmm. who do this everything by properly vegan principles. Mm. And there's Delfland, which is the biggest kind of organic nursery, which is in, I think, Cambridgeshire. They're not all organic, but a lot of it is. And, you know, they do a wide range of crops. Then there's Walcott Fruit Trees and then retail-wise Hume Community Garden Centre in Manchester. There's a big gap in the market, like a really big gap in the market, I think, for organic plants. Mm. Not necessarily even vegan plants, but organic plants. You know, where are they? Why aren't they there? Organic seeds have, have happened mm. this year and is going to go into next year. Sutton Seeds have launched them. Thomas and Morgan are talking about a vegan product. And Mr. Fothergills have much increased their organic seed range. And in the past, they said it was too small to even bother with. So I think there's something going on there, hopefully. I mean, I know when we were at Hortus Loci, I I spoke to Mark Straver about it. And he said, you know, he'd love to have his nursery go onto, you know, garden according to the vegan principles. But he can't because he produces show plants for, for show gardens. And sadly, you know, to get the plants to that kind of super lush looking state and absolutely perfect sometimes that isn't going to be what you're going to achieve if you're gardening vegan and organically so that could be an issue if you're if you're you have a garden center and you've got a plant that's come from the continent versus one you've grown in house sometimes there is just that aesthetic appeal and I think maybe once we educate consumers a little bit better it's like you know going out and buying the wonky veg if we just say sometimes look this is what a plant will look like if it's grown quote unquote normally then it might take time but eventually perhaps we will get there no it's very difficult with plants because obviously you're buying them for aesthetic value in a lot of cases Mm -hmm. um, for ornamental plants I mean, for a wonky carrot you you make it into soup it doesn't really matter yeah true so yeah with the ornamental plants is a really, really big ask to sell ornamental plants that don't look perfect. Despite the fact that when you get them in your garden, they're not going to look that perfect. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> within a day, they're going to be chewed by something. Aren't they? <laughs> but for the Chelsea Show Garden thing, I mean, obviously that's a, you know, I, I love Chelsea, and it, but it's it's a, it's a, a fitful build. It's for sort of cameras, you know. So Mark Straber's right. You can't have a plant that doesn't look perfect there. No, no. It's like the Disney Gardens, and they're not that realistic i mean looking at that show garden thing hampton court had a garden by joseph gibson who was at the horse low guy event which was about uh, vegan gardening which had a kind of slaughterhouse in the garden showing that you know the destruction of the rainforest so the rhs has been ahead of the game on that in some ways mm. I mean, looking at chelsea next year i don't see anything that's going to look at those issues but i mean i suppose the only garden that might have a little bit of a look at it is forestry commission has got a 100th anniversary garden there so that's going to look at sort of biosecurity and biodiversity but what's important to me about all these big organizations like forest commission national trust this is a big thing in my book all these garden all these big big parks and gardens organizations they haven't got any real commitment to wildlife and animals and caring about wildlife and basically they'll destroy habitats and kill animals but whilst talking about how they love animals and they love wildlife and they want tourists to come and see it and you know there's a hypocrisy there and hopefully that's getting exposed yeah yeah i mean your anecdote about the peter rabbit garden I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's my, that's my killer anecdote, <laughs> but it's true. I'm not going to reveal and, it then. You have and, to buy the book to, to hear that. <laughs> no, no. Well, exactly. But it, but it's true. And my, my kids are so upset when I keep repeating this anecdote. But I didn't tell them at the time when they were very small. But no. basically, the anecdote with Peter Rabbit is in the Pete Beatrix Potter's garden, there's, there's Mr. McGregor's garden there. And there's obviously rabbits. So what do they do with the Peter Rabbit? They shoot it. <laughs> It's just awful, isn't it? I don't know if they still do, but that's what they told me a few years ago. Yeah. Oh, it just destroys the innocence of childhood. (laughs) Yeah. That's what I'm all about. (laughs) Yeah. 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 (laughs) Disabusing people of their nice notions. So just to finish up, I was going to ask you, your book, it provides seriously compelling evidence and loads of it as to why you might want to consider trying vegan organic gardening. But if you had to give just one reason why people would switch, what would you say? 
Yeah, well, I mean, I, th- I thought about this, and I've thought about this while doing these talks. And you know, people are vegans because they might care about the wider environment and about their own personal health, but what they really care about is animals and animal welfare. You know, that's the real reason to be a vegan. I think. You know, obviously, there's a load of other reasons, but that is probably people's underlying reason. So, you know, if you really care about animals, then you probably would, if you really thought about it, would only garden in a vegan manner. So, if I had to give a reason why people would switch, it's because you really care about animals and this is the way to show it in this aspect of your life. What a way to wrap up the vegan gardening series. I'd like to say a massive thank you to Matt for the interview and I wish him all the best with the launch of the Super Organic Gardener. If you'd like to be in with a chance to win that book, head on over to my Twitter where I'm Roots and All. All you need to do is follow and share my pinned tweet to be in with a shout. Thank you also to Cleve and to Caroline for taking part in the other episodes of the Vegan Gardening series and thank you to you too for listening. Don't forget if you enjoyed these episodes, why not head over to my Patreon or GoFundMe pages, search Roots and All and sling me a few quid to keep me in Oreos for the next couple of weeks. Join me next Tuesday for a podcast and have a great week. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter, which gives you a weekly roundup of content, plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work. Because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.